Please welcome your moderator for today's Engage webinar, the Managing Director of Leadership and Programming at the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Eva Chang. Hello, and welcome to the George W. Bush Institute's webinar on creating opportunity in education and workforce. Today, we'll be covering several topics like how do we pre better prepare our students for our futures? Um, should we redefine what success means around education in the workforce? And how do we create more opportunities for more people? I do have one logistical note for you before I, I introduce our panelists. Uh, this is an interactive webinar. So at the end, we'll be taking your questions. I'll kick us off with some prepared questions, including some that you all submitted. So thank you for that. But if you'd like to add a question, look at your Zoom controls and you'll see one called Q&A. You can start typing those questions in whenever you're ready. And as time allows, we'll get to as many as we can. So with that, let me introduce our first panelist. Ann Wicks is our Ann Kimball Johnson Director of Education and Opportunity. She leads the policy research and engagement work of our education and our economic growth teams here at the Bush Center. She has expertise in education and workforce pipeline issues, accountability and assessment, and school leadership. She served as an associate dean in higher ed, and she currently serves on the board of Dallas After School Instruction Partners and Education Open Doors. Hello, Ann. Hi, Eva. All right, joining Ann, we have Governor Bill Haslam, our Salmon's Enterprise Fellow here at the Bush Institute. He is the former governor of the state of Tennessee, and under his leadership, Tennessee students were the fastest growing in academic achievement in our nation. Um, he also created under his leadership, 450,000 jobs in the state of Tennessee, which led to the lowest unemployment rate in the state's history. He's a recognized leader in education, economic development, and effective government. Now he's returned to the private sector, and we're lucky to have him as a fellow at the Bush Center. He's also the chair of the Wilson Center and serves on the National Board of Directors of Teach for America and the Young Life Board. Hello, Governor Haslam. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. All right, so let me let me kick us off by talking about my favorite topic, which is middle schoolers. Um, eighth graders, and this first question is for you to start us off. Eighth graders are our kiddos who are heading into high school in the fall, and they'll be entering the workforce in about eight years in 2030. So, and what should we be doing right now to make sure that they are prepared for the workforce? Such a good question. And I think for those of you who know and hopefully love an eighth grader or somewhere around that age, it can be hard to think about them being a colleague in eight years when you, you know, know how they might, how they might act at school or at home. But I think one of the things that's really helpful to put into context for this conversation is what's actually happening for kids now. There's been a lot of conversation about COVID, the learning loss for kids. How do we help kids recover and get back on track? But yesterday, several of us got a little preview of some great analysis done by our colleagues at um, NAGB, the National Assessment Governing Board. They're the folks who put out NAEP, part of the alphabet soup of um, ed policy, the National Assessment of Education Progress. That's often called the nation's report card. And that's, um, that's existed for decades and it's sampled, a sample test that's given around the country and it's the best apples to apples comparison of kids we can look at across the country, right? Every state has their summative assessment, their annual test that they'll give, but they're not quite what they give in. Minnesota isn't the same as Tennessee, as Texas, as Nevada, et cetera. They're all, they're similar, but not the same. So um, our, our colleagues there had shared, they've done some analysis of 2009 to 2019. So that decade leading up into uh, COVID and what's happening for eighth graders. And we're seeing something that's quite troubling. And so when we talk about, we just have to recover from COVID learning loss, actually there was something happening in that decade prior that we need to pay attention to. We wanna of course support our educators who are helping kids recover right now, but it looks like the composition of kids in that bottom 25th percentile, they're getting farther behind, they're getting that composition is, is changing. It's not sort of the more typical, oh, we have achievement gaps that exist based on race, poverty, socioeconomic status, or if they're English language learners, or some of the more ways where, oh, that's what's happening in that group of kids. Their analysis shows that bottom 25% looks now, which had the, this one that jumped out to me, 60% of those kids have college educated parents and they're scoring in the bottom 25th percentile on the nation's report card. And that used to be a little bit of a shorthand, right? We think kids would be kind of inoculated if they've got parents who are college educated. Chances are 
they're going to do fine. They're going to be able to access what they need. And, and that looks different about, um, you know, 70% of those kids are not classified as this, uh, with a disability or special ed. Um, over 80% of them speak English as their primary language, they're native English speakers, so they weren't learning to speak English, which may have gotten them behind. So I think that's something really interesting to pay attention to. What have we done for our eighth graders, actually, in that decade leading into COVID? What have we set up folks for? And it asks some big questions, I think, for us about the you know, kinds of instruction that we're delivering, um, the, the talent, how we're supporting educators to, to reach kids. So I just think that's an interesting context to put this in, um, and what's happening for kids. Yeah, potentially a new trend we haven't kept our eyes closely enough on. What about you, Governor Haslam? Anything to add there and things we should be thinking about? No, I think Ann's point, and that data is incredibly concerning to me because it shows that we have issues, not just where we traditionally have had issues, uh, number one, number two. I'm of the camp that we're going to be seeing the impact of COVID for a long time. And we're going to have to make, you know, concerted specific efforts to catch up. You know, we have, you know, the good news is there's all this Ezra money out there now. Um, and I think it's, I know there's a lot of different people on this call. It's incumbent upon all of us where we have input to make certain that we're using that to actually help students get to the outcomes in the, in the, um, the, perform the performance that they need to be on some sort of uh, evaluative assessment that Ann mentioned that NAEP is, is the one thing that we have. Uh, and we need to all take that data to heart and say, you know, we had some major issues going into COVID, those have been multiplied and let's make certain that we use those resources that are, I would argue, are maybe a once in a lifetime amount of resources in wise ways. Oh, Governor Haslam, so there's been a lot of discussion um, for our kiddos going into the workforce about credentials, work-ready degrees, things like that, and companies like Amazon and Starbucks are sort of leading the way in investing big money in education. So is that the de facto for the future? Can these big companies take some of the weight off of our school system? What do you think this will look like in the next few decades? I think the, I think the smart systems are going to figure out how to go to the end user in many cases uh, and say, can you, you know, I, I know that we're not doing a great job of providing the talent you need. Can, can you help us do that? An example in Tennessee, we put one of our uh, technology schools actually on the campus of Nissan's automobile plant in Smyrna, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. It's the for a long time produced more vehicles than any plan in the history of, of North America. And so we actually put a, 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 a community college technical school on campus with them. So they're, they're, I mean, it was a win for them because they got to literally have these graduates uh, or these potential graduates working in their backyard, if you will, and they could it gave them a recruiting advantage. But number two, it helped even those folks who didn't get hired by Nissan they were getting to see this world-class manufacturer up close and personal. I think the point being, you're, you're going to see companies start interacting a lot more in the process early and not just, oh, we're going to, our, our company is going to adopt, you know, Acres Elementary School to be the, the corporate sponsor, but to actually engage. Um, I think that the answer even to your question ultimately is this, is Governor, what I always wanted to do is try to have as many tools in the tool bag as we could. And so for those uh, students who like, hey, I, I want to be a welder, I'm going to make certain we have enough seats in that welding class for as many people are interested. And for that person who wants a PhD in Eastern European literature, we, we would provide, we're going to provide that as well. But it's all about having a tool bag that can meet the needs of a, of a, of a wide assortment of people. Yeah, and what do you think about the tool bag? No, it's so true. And I, I will say, even though we know Amazon made like a, this huge announcement, right? They're going to spend $1.2 billion to help about 300,000 of their employees, it's a third of their workforce, get a degree. And you've, if you work there 90 days, you get, you're eligible, right? You don't have to be there a year and then get reimbursed. They will they still join you and do this. But when we talk to the folks at Amazon who are implementing this, they're not building Amazon University. They're not building new campuses, right? They're relying on the, the existing structure that's out there to help bring more people into our kind of more traditional higher ed system. I think that's really interesting. And that's one of those tools in the toolbox. And so if you're an enterprising system leader, 
enterprising governor, right? How do you take advantage of a company that's willing to make that kind of investment to help bring folks? And typically those might be adults who are, they may have some college, they may have a high school degree, they may have some college, but no degree, right? How they're, they're ripe for completion in a way that we know would, would give them some real options going forward. And so I think that's the thing to know is that I don't think companies are going to start becoming, uh, you know, the higher ed system, and it's going to really require how higher ed works to to maneuver in ways that they probably haven't been challenged to. I mean, we see another former governor who became a university president, Mitch Daniels at Purdue. He's really taken that idea of value and partnership to heart and what he's done in the last decade at Purdue. And I think you find that in really interesting universities that will start to shine and really separate out. And when when families and kids are thinking about what what's the value for me in investing money and time to get um, a degree what's next. And let me, one, one last thing before we leave this topic, Eva, I'll only uh, add on to what Ann said. I think the smart systems, whether they be K-12 or post-secondary, are going to figure out how to truly partner with um, with employers. And they're going to say, like I said, we loved it, you know, before when you sponsored this or, or that, but we actually need you in, engage with us because the corporations, they don't want to make the capital expenditure to, to have their own infrastructure out there. And that doesn't make sense anyway. So I'm betting like you gave the example of Mitch, I can give example of governors and superintendents and county mayors who are, are looking at it in that way. I think those are the people who are going to win. And the, the last thing I'd say on that is this, when I first came into office in 2000, I was elected in November of 2010, sworn in in January of 11. And when we were competing for economic development projects, to be honest with you, it was all about who could offer the best deal on the best piece of dirt uh, to somebody. By the time I left, they were still, companies were still negotiating for the best incentive package they could get, but, and, and they wanted the best location, but it was way more about, can you give us the workforce we need? And so we were just, get, we just had begun getting to that point of, we can, but you need to help us. Uh, and the smart companies are, are, are doing that. So in these smart systems where the companies and the school systems are working together, I want to think about the 15, 16, 17, and 18 year olds. And one of our participants submitted this question. Um, she, she or he pointed out that only 46% of high school graduates even attempt a post-secondary credential and only 26% succeed in earning one. So what are we doing to advise those young kids how to be, how to really participate in these smart systems? Well, let me jump in there uh, first. Uh, the One of the, you know, we can talk later if you want about the, the dramatic fall off in community college attendance in particular that we've seen uh, coming out of COVID. I think one of the big impacts, what we started the Tennessee Promise, we were the first state to have two years free of community college or technical school. And we got a lot of, you know, a lot of attaboys for, uh, and, and, you know, pats on the back for a first, you know, to provide this, you know, the free experience. The key in all that um, was having college and career counselors in the high schools who were working hard to get people to fill out the FAFSA form and to uh, actually push them, hey, you can do this, you can go to college. Um, the, you know, the, the mindset of families that have never had anybody go to college is such that they just, hey, we don't even talk about that at our dinner table. And so you have to start changing the conversation. You change that by using the existing infrastructure. And what I think would happen, one of the things that happened with COVID is they didn't have that high school counselor saying, hey, Johnny or Judy, you need to fill out the FAFSA form. You need to take the ACT. You need to, do, you know, pushing them to do all those things. The, our college, our community college attendance went way up. But it started with, we started setting records for the percentage of students who filled out a FAFSA form. So it's somebody that will make that initial push and that's tying your K-12 systems in and making certain that's a priority. Governor, I have to tell you the competition you all had with Louisiana, between Louisiana yeah. and Tennessee on FAFSA completion helped inspire our pipeline tool because we had some folks who said, I know governors are competitive about this and state chiefs are competitive. What if, what other kind of state level data can we put together in one spot to help do that? But I think that's such a, it's such a good point about there's sometimes, this is a really complex landscape, right? You don't want to oversimplify, but things like FAFSA completion, we know make a big difference, right? To help give people some agency 
about their choices and information about choices that come next. The counseling is so important. I think I, I sit on the board of a nonprofit here in North Texas called Education Open Stores. It was started by a teacher, um, a TFA alum, Governor Haslam, who had given your service on that board, who knew her eighth grade students, most of them just, they were not sitting at those dinner tables, right, where they were having conversations about their futures and what was possible. So she started building that into her curriculum in the classroom. That has now turned into 10 years of a nonprofit that works with eighth graders around North Texas and a great embedded curriculum around and very high quality around how do you give 13 and 14 year olds knowledge and some agency. It's embedded in their class every week throughout their eighth grade year, right? So it's kind of not this thing that sits out that they might go to a seminar on once, right? It's a little bit more part of the core of what they do. And I think that kind of thing, plus the trained counselors, plus increasing FAFSA, you know, those are the things that we can do that will actually help some kids um, build their own knowledge base, build their own agency and choices about their future that are interesting to me um, as people are implementing them. So Governor Haslam, you mentioned community college. That is our nation's best kept, not so secret <laughs> intervention for giving kids um, a effective, but co cost effective, but quality education. But we've seen a huge drop in enrollment from 7.7 .7 million students in 2019, 2020 to the next year down to 4.8 million. And most of those are attending part-time. So how can we recover? How can we recover from this hit that community colleges have taken in student enrollment? I think there's a couple of things. Number one, you have to realize the role of the economy and in this labor short economy that we're in, a lot of folks look around their graduate high school and they say, hey, I can go tomorrow and get a 17 or $18 an hour job. Um, and that's pretty hard to turn down. And so some of it we just have to recognize is, you know, the stronger the economy is, the more um, short workforce we are, the more demand there's going to be. That's, that just is, and it's just part of supply and demand, and uh, it's what we have to recognize. But I think it makes it all, all the more incumbent upon us, uh, people and the uh, folks like on this call to say, yes, but don't make a short-term decision uh, with really long-term consequences and to help define the differences of here's what it's like if you get a post-secondary certificate or a two-year degree or, or a four-year degree. We have to do a better job of doing that. I think, but the other thing is it's important to look where the fall off has been and we've fallen off um, on males uh, and particularly on males of color. And that's really concerning. And I'm thinking, I, I personally think, again, it's back to not having that in-person contact of a, of a college and career uh, counselor at high school saying, hey, have you filled out this form? Have you done this? You can go to college. You can go to technical school. You can, uh, you know, you can get a degree beyond this, which you'll really need. So I think some of it's economy. Some of it is is we get back in college, getting people to refocus on this. And then the third thing, I think you did say the point about community colleges being one of our best kept secrets. I, the, the reason I love community colleges is they're, they're you know, four-year schools are, they're battleships. It takes a long time to turn them around. You know, the, uh, the, the, the community colleges can operate like a speedboat. They can literally change direction, you know, between this semester and next semester in Course, course offerings and what they're focusing on. And so I think the, the last thing is the community colleges need to now do a better job of, okay, the market's gotten tougher for us. What are we going to do to change to both market our services and to make certain we're offering what people want and not just those things that our faculty wants to teach. I love that idea of community colleges as speedboat because it's so true. I mean, whenever I talk to anybody who's leading a program or anything at a community college, I'm always struck by their, I don't know if it's groundedness or pragmatism, the good ones, right? Like they are keenly in touch with their students and they typically have some really interesting local partnerships that they've just kind of built. They, did, they haven't necessarily been asking for permission. They just sort of like, you know, they, if there is a, there is a, um, it, there's a, a sort of practicality, I think, that the many of the great ones are um, thinking really, they're just really clear about value. The value proposition is more front of mind than sometimes it's in the air. When you think about kind of some of the other institutions, you just assume you stepped on campus and you're breathing, you're getting the value just hanging around. 
But let me throw one other thing out there. Uh, I think states should and, and uh, school systems should seriously think about, and I know you're gonna say, well, it doesn't sound like a very Republican idea, weren't you a Republican governor? But what we found with community colleges is that a lot of the students that drop out, life happens to them and they're living on a very precarious edge to begin with. And so we put some dollars first philanthropic and now we're getting some state dollars going there that provide the wraparound services, like where we've got a board you can apply to that if, if your car breaks down and that's the reason you can't go to college anymore, we will give you a, a you know a, a short term stipend or something along the way. We've those wraparound services we think have, have had dramatic effect on dropping or lowering the dropout rate mm -hmm. and, and increasing our completion rate because, like I said, what we learned really quickly getting people into college was great, but it, uh, free, but it didn't help if two things. Number one, if they were living on such a precarious edge that the, the least little thing made them drop out, and two. And even more importantly, it didn't help if they weren't prepared when they got there. So that's why the K-12 reform efforts that um, you all have been a part of and others are so critical as well. I think that, um, I'm so glad you said that, Governor. I was thinking about, I know people have asked about credentials and, and how to think about all that. And I always go back to, you know, what do we want eighth graders to learn, right? To be able to be productive in the workforce. And it's, sometimes there are, new exciting skills. I think we'll get to some of that that are relevant, but it just doesn't matter if they can't read and write and do math. There's no way, there's no way around that, which is part of why, you know, looking at NAEP data for the wonky nerds in this uh, virtual room, right? We all love it because you just, you just can't maneuver around that. If, if, if young people don't have that base, the basic skills, then they're not going to be able to access the knowledge and the discernment and the sort of context that unlock the world for them. Um, so it's not to say we shouldn't be thinking about some of those new skills or shiny things, but we just we have to actually say true things about what they need to even be able to to get there. Yeah, so I'm going to throw in a question. Those were the easy questions. So we're going to get to some hard <laughs> ones. Um, I'm going to throw in a question that was answered live here um, that says, you know, many initiatives for everything that y'all are talking about are actually geared towards 11th grade students and up. So how can state agencies and others work together to plant seeds that are younger? And you mentioned education open doors, but how do we get, how else are we getting, or should we be getting to those younger students? Because like you said, Governor Haslam, some of these conversations aren't happening at the dinner table. So how do we supplement that and start planting that seed earlier? Yeah, I'll start. If you look, and I don't want to take us down a whole nother rabbit trail, but one of the things that some of our more uh, innovative charter school networks have done is that they do, they start that idea of talking about college early. And I, that's, you know, in one of the, one of the reasons I believe in a variety of school options is I think we can see, we can test ideas and see what works. And one of those things is starting to talk about college and the varieties of oper post-secondary opportunities that are available early in the process. And I, I would love to see our, and I think we're starting to see that, our kind of tradition, however you want to refer to our traditional K-12 networks uh, of doing that. Um, to your point, by the time you're a junior, in some way, you've already, you know, the, the cookies are already baked. You know, you've already made a choice about what courses you're going to take and, you know, what sort of, you know, post-secondary prep you're going to do. And so, one of the things is to have, we start out talking about middle schools, have our middle schools start having those conversations. That is definitely not too early. If you look at the world that our 12 through 14 year olds are, are living in now, they're exposed to a whole lot of adult ideas, good and bad, now that you know I'm, I'm in my mid sixties that I, didn't occur to me when I was in the seventh grade. And so I think you know the corresponding thought is they're starting to think about adult things um, in a lot of ways, um, younger, good, like I said, good and bad, we need to have part of that be what, what's life going to look like for you after you finish school and what do you need to do now to, to be where you want to be? I think that's so true, right? If we think about kids, executive functioning is not like <laughs> their sweet spot, right? Like I, I think about, I was a knucklehead in so many ways when I was 14 and 15 and I, but I was wildly confident and, you know, had no reason to be quite frankly. Right. And you think, you know, everything. And so I think that like the, you can't underestimate the role that 
caring adults can play in helping kids understand themselves and their world and context. It doesn't come naturally. It takes time, but it's not unteachable, right? It's not, you can help kids sort of figure out what that looks like, especially now. I mean, you know, as you were saying, Governor, that the world world is moving really fast. There are some big complicated issues that kids can't help but be exposed to. Um, I know we share at the Bush Institute, along with you, a real interest in high quality school leaders, uh, the role of great teachers, right? Like the, there's, you can't sort of ignore the adults in our system who are working with kids and what we're doing to prepare and support them um, to lead campuses where a lot of this actually, the rubber hits the road, you know, in terms of what gets implemented. And I think we can't, I know Eva, you have a real passion for the kind of talent that we actually bring into the sector and support because this is, it's big complicated work, you know, to do this, to do this well. Yeah, okay, I got another tough one from one of our participants. So this is a good time for me to remind you, or if you join late, to use your Q&A button um, in your Zoom features to keep typing those questions in. We've got some great ones here. So here's your question. How do we redefine the meaning of success in education to include the acquisition of skills, professional cert certifications, access to internships, uh, internships, excuse me, for our work readiness in our students? Not everyone goes to college, but everyone probably will go to work. Yeah, I really do think it's, I mean, it's back to what I talked about earlier with this kind of having a tool bag and emphasizing that, you know, all, we don't have like, oh, these are the greater tools and these are the lesser tools. Um, that's just, we haven't done people a, a service by saying the ultimate goal for everybody should be four-year college. That's, that's, that's not the ultimate goal for everybody. I, I personally think there's, we, we need to be pushing or we need to be encouraging more kids to think about, you know, um, higher educational opportunities, but we don't do anyone a, a service when we don't emphasize that, hey, if, if your bent is toward the sort of skill set that we can help um, uh, accelerate through technical school or community college, go for it. And we are all with you and, and for you. We want to help make that happen. Um, I do think it's about changing our conversation. Um, and as adults, like I said, when we only say, you know, true success looks like four-year college, that's just not helpful and it's not true. Say for the, the, you know, if you're somebody on this call who is a staffer, a policy wonk, and you're looking for information on this, one of my favorite resources is Credential Engine, which is one of the best out there that has is pulled together lots of information about this huge range of credential options around the country. There's something like, I think there's almost a million different credentials, whether it's a degree or a diploma or a certificate. That's an overwhelming amount of options, <laughs> you know, for somebody to navigate when you think about that. How do I know what's going to be worth my time? So if you are, if you're thinking about this, trying to figure out how to make some policy on this, I would, I'd send you to Credential Engine. They have a couple of great reports around this, some state policy action plans that might be useful that I think that's where we're going to start to see one of the, you know, over the next 10 years is a little more clarity on how do you think about that big bucket of stuff for lack of a better word so that folks people out there we have better educated better informed consumers of those credentials as they start to make decisions about what to pursue whether it is as the governor said a four-year degree or something else there's there's we know people accessing something beyond high school is really meaningful to their ability to to earn and support themselves and their families over time so whatever that looks like could be really different um, depending on who you are and where you live all right, the next question is from me. Like Ann said, I spend a lot of time thinking about our talent and it turns out that we have a new generation entering our workforce, Generation Z. Um, our 24 and 25 year olds, many of our young teachers um, in our schools um, and they're, they're approaching work different. What they want is different. Um, they were born with technology in their hands. I have a great example. I was teaching a grad student who's also a principal um, many of us have experienced doing teacher observations where we take notes in the back of the room and then after hours we're typing up our notes and sending them to the teacher. Well, he's managed to create a workaround where he uses Google Forms and Google Voice Notes and he was trying to uh, teach some of us and the other generations and we were just flabbergasted, but, but he didn't want to spend his evening sending notes and he wanted his teachers to have immediate feedback and he had the knowledge to do that. So knowing that these new generations are coming in, they approach work differently, they have different skills than us, 
Um, what does that mean for skills we should be prioritizing in K-12 and in higher ed? And what are we going to need from tomorrow's professionals? How are we going to manage them? Ann, go ahead. No, I was going to say, Governor, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. I mean, you, you, you see my level of techn technology expertise and that I'm, I'm coming to you from an airport con uh, conference room because when this was set up, I, I live on, in Eastern time and I inadvertently wrote it down that this was at 1115 Eastern. So mm -hmm. I ended up squeezing myself into, uh, well, I'll go make the call from the airport and hopefully still make my flight uh, because uh, I, I forgot the, the difference in Central and Eastern. So let me qualify with just how capable I am, okay? <laughs> um, number one, but number two, I, it, listen, I, I think it's really smart to be aware of generational differences and you can't paint with too broad a brush and say, well, okay, this whole generation is this way. That's not true. But there are certain proclivities or, uh, uh, or whatever you want to call it that, that folks have. This generation really, I think, is there's the, the great side is that they're going to think of ways to use technology to make life simpler and easier and more effective. Okay. They, they just are, and they're already doing, that. I've got, my oldest grandson is 10 and a half and he's, he already is showing me how to, you know, to, to do stuff. I mean, so that's just, that's just the world they live in. And we need to realize, don't, don't get in the way of that happening, help that to happen. Um, and don't, you know, don't, like I said, make certain you're not an obstacle. Number one, number two, though, this is a world that I, this is a generation. I think I've, I've, I teach college courses on an occasional basis or, or just like to teach in college settings as, as a guest lecturer. And I'm always impressed by the fact that this generation is, they really do, they do have a high social conscience. They really do want to change the world and they want to change it because they, they, I think a, like I said, it's, there's a lot of things that, you know, our generation's messed up that they, you know, won't want to see different. Um, and they think, in some ways, technology can help make that happen. What I think they're missing is a sense of the reality of what the world um, looks like. And that's because they've grown up in a world that technology is shaped as well because it's allowed them to live in um, kind of social media silos where they talk and communicate with people who think and act just like they do. And so there's not this sense of, oh, actually solving that problem is going to mean talking to people who don't agree with me uh, on issues. Uh, uh, and that number one and number two, those issues, by the way, are a lot more complex than they think they are. So I'm not exactly asking you, answering your question about technology, but I think it's, you know, that, that would be the, the two things I'd say is don't get in the way of letting them use technology to make our lives uh, more effective and simpler. Number two, don't, underestimate the impact that growing up in a world with a lot more available technology, which has meant a lot more access to social media, which means they can choose their news and choose their, their views um, or what, what views they listen to in a lot different way than, again, those of us who grew up in the 1960s could do. I love that. I love that. Don't be a barrier because, yeah. you know, they can make our lives better, easier, more efficient. And what would you add? No, I was going to say, we know, we always know, right? The next generation makes everything better, faster, stronger. We'll break some things and that's appropriate and it's, it's how progress happens. I think what's so interesting about this and what the governor was sharing, I, one of my pet peeves or things I think of a lot is how do you give people the ability to discern, build their skills and discernment, right? Like, how do you know what you're reading? Like, how do you ask the right kind of questions? How do you have the skills and the context and the knowledge to sort of make good decisions. So one of the things I think about it with your example that you gave Eva, right, about the student you had who's automating his notes, sending feedback. You and I were discussing earlier when you told me this that I was like, oh, wait, we would be sit down and re reviewing it. We'd be making sure, am I getting the right takeaways? Am I thinking about the context? Am I, right, is like doing some analysis, messing with that on our own, pushing and pulling, that he was willing to just move on from, you know, and I'm like, is that right? Is that wrong? Does anything get mixed in that sort of the messy middle where we sometimes get to um, push and pull on information? I don't know what the right answer is. It's probably somewhere in the middle, but I think it's really important to be challenged by someone's like, no, you can do this faster. And probably the value that is delivered is just as good. And I think that's a really interesting challenge for us to think about in a lot of ways. Um, but I'll always, I'll die on my hill of discernment forever. <laughs> 
We get Hilda down. <laughs> Okay, speaking of talent, here's another question from our participants. Are there any leaders in the education sector you believe are successful at addressing these needs? So anybody we should be paying attention to, if you're anything like me answering this question off the top of your head, my brain always turns off, so I'm just talking a little to give you some time to think of <laughs> any folks you may want to point us to here. And the and you get to go first on this. I went first last time. <laughs> sure. I'm a, a <laughs> boss at Carrie Ray. I always hate that name one thing question, too. I know. Yes. Well, this one's top of mind. So this is the bit. Uh, Carrie Wright, who's been the state chief in Mississippi for a long time, she is um, retiring. She had an unbelievable career. But if you've been paying attention to the, um, to the data, um, Mississippi has been a success story in the last uh, over the last decade as they've made in this incredible investment in how to teach reading for kids and they've seen use the research developed and implement and implemented not just develop policy but actually did the hard work of implementing it well in Mississippi to change how they teach reading in the state that has started to transform academic outcomes, particularly for kids who have have not been well served for decades. I think it's a really exciting story about how adults can make great decisions using research and commit to implementing a strong policy that and kids are clearly benefiting. So I really, I really admire Carrie's leadership in Mississippi as a state chief. Um, so I'd share that example. That is going interesting. I think part of Mississippi's success is it was kind of an interesting kind of private public partnership on the reading that originally had, I think the Barksdale Foundation had a big role in that. So again, Good models can uh, and examples can come from anywhere, and uh, and that's definitely one. I'd I'd go back to a person. I'll, since since you picked a, a K twelve model, I'll, I'll go higher ed. I do think what Mitch Daniels has done at Purdue with emphasizing outcomes, emphasizing we're going to provide a high quality deal. We're not going to raise tuition for I think twelve years or something that they've gone on. I think it just shows that innovation can happen and can work even in, uh, you know, in, in this education environment that a lot of folks think uh, that throw up their hand and say, it's just too hard to make change happen. You can find leaders who actually have made a difference. And again, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't ever like the name, you know, name an example, because as soon as I get off, it's like, oh man, I should have talked about, you know, so-and-so <laughs> because uh, I, I know so many great leaders in education all the way from second grade teachers to, like I said, to, to college presidents. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'll just add, I think, you know, for folks listening, look at your local schools. I mean, there are some quiet, amazing principals and their leadership teams just sort of plugging through no matter what happens and they're leading and doing great things for kids. So uh, it's not just these big names, but there's, they're quiet, but very impactful leaders all around us. So great question. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears. We're gonna to go to policy. Um, what, uh, we know that policies will have to change to get this right. Um, so um, let's see, Anne went first last time. So Governor Haslam, we'll start with you. Can you tell us about a favorite, you can define favorite however you want, a favorite policy that was passed when you were in office that made some innovative change happen. It can be on the education, it can be on workforce, you can take us wherever you want. Yeah, I mean, I. I I actually, again, I, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is is the Tennessee promise that I brought before the two years free community college technical school, and not a lot of states have done it. But I think for me, the reason that was such a big deal is, I, you know, when you're governor, you it's a little bit like being the quarterback of your of the football team. You get more credit when you win and more blame when you lose than you deserve. Both, you know, both good and bad, and so that literally was a product of a whole lot of people working to make that happen and said that the idea wasn't even initially mine okay but what the reason I say that about getting more credit is I, to this day I run into people all the time you know somebody that was you know uh you know helping out it was delivering something to our house house and helping unload the truck was saying, hey, I don't know if you know this, but my my son got to go to college because of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I hear these stories all the time about what a difference that makes and changing people's uh, perspective on what is possible is just such a big issue. And again, with our first with first generation college students, um, it's it's just hard to to describe how much difference it's made in those dinner table conversations. So 
I do think that's one. I, I'll, I'll go one more. The and I'll we, we had an extraordinary period in this country of of consensus around big education ideas. Okay, and if you think about what President Bush started, he was saying, "Hey, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, that." high expectations in education should be determined by zip code. And that was, a, that was a pretty radical idea for a Republican president to push. And then you think about President Obama who came along and said, hey, we're gonna have race to the top and we're gonna, again, regardless of what you think about race to the top, okay, or no child left behind. But he, he said, we're gonna, we're gonna require um, assessments, uh, uh, quality assessments to see what a student has learned. We're going to raise standards and we're going to evaluate teachers based on what their students have learned. That was a pretty radical thing for a Democrat president to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two pretty different presidents, they didn't agree a lot, but they both on education said outcomes matter and we're going to insist that, you know, low expectations um, are one of the worst kinds of prejudice that you can have. Um, that, was, that was an extraordinary period for our country as opposed to, Again, I think today our school board meetings um, have, have seen this incredible increase in parental engagement, which is a really good thing. But I think, you know, when we're arguing about mass versus no mask and not about what are we doing to recruit the highest quality teachers we can, that's a little long term concerning. So I, I know I wandered all over the place with your question, but that's the stuff that's kind of in my heart right now. I'm concerned that we're going to take our eye off the ball in terms of better outcomes for students being our focus. Yep, and, um, and so can you quickly share about the policy decision guide that your team created, wh where it came from and how it helps with some of these policy decisions? Sure, sure. We, I mean, Eva, you know this, we, we hammer on outcome data all the time around here that you measure outcomes, not inputs. And in conversations with some um, state and district leaders, we found they're like, yes, I have all this data. What do I do with all of this? How do I use it to make decisions? And I thought, well, that's a fair question. We don't do a great job of training and supporting educators or de policy decision makers, right? And if you look at these big outcome data sets, what's the right kind of analysis? So we, we built a policy decision guide. You can find it on our, um, our pipeline. We actually got to work with some folks in Tennessee governor who gave us some feedback to make sure it was, we were actually, it was appropriate, but it asked people a series of questions about outcome data in your state, the priorities that you have, where the political winds are blowing, what do you, what could you really get done? Um, and what, how will you know if it's going to be uh, impactful? How do you think about implementation? You know, is this a, does this policy already exist in your state and it just needs, you need to update an existing policy in some way, or have you already kind of solved this and you actually just need to make sure a policy that's on the books gets implemented differently? It's sort of a way to navigate all those things from once you take, okay, we know some kids are not getting what they need. They're not being supported in the ways they deserve. So the then what, how do you actually use policy to drive for action? One of the things I love is you think about when we were talking about the importance of having outcome data as we were going through the pandemic, Texas, for example, did and was able to use that outcome data to design policy in our last ledge session that brought high dosage tutoring to specific kids who had struggled on our state assessment. It also gave parents some choices to, if your child had failed our state assessment, you were entitled to be in a high quality teacher classroom the next year, like very specific policy things that were the result of some careful analysis of that outcome data. It wasn't just saying, holy cow, some of our kids have really suffered during the pandemic. It actually gave some practical solutions and next steps to take to help serve kids. And I love that idea of how can we more pragmatically sometimes connect the outcome data we talk about to real solutions for our educators and parents. So that's that guide exists to help people try to decipher and take some steps through the big mess of data we have sometimes. Perfect. Thanks so much for walking us through that. Um, okay, shifting gears just a little bit. So we talk a lot about opportunity around here. And what we mean by that is um, what will help more Americans to live with choices about their, to give them more choices about their future. Um, and so that they have the ability to support themselves and their families. Um, to many, that sounds like expanding the middle class. A high school diploma used to get you there. What will it take today to expand those options? 
Anne, you want to jump in? Well, I have two kind of ideas, but I'm curious what the governor thinks because this is, you know. Yeah, no, you, you uh, go I, ahead. I have two things that I'm always curious okay. about, right? Like, so if you have more than your high school diploma, what things I care about are how do we increase access to capital for people so more people can access, whether that's starting, supporting, or growing a business, right? What is that? How do we do that in a different way that will give people the ability to build and grow in ways that sometimes hasn't been, there hasn't been that sort of even access to? And then the second, this idea of that we're never, we're, all of us have a, we'll have to be lifelong learners in some ways. So the idea that you're, you may have, you're going to have to build and gain skills most likely throughout your life. And that that becomes more common to know that you're never sort of vaccinated with enough skills and knowledge, right? And then you're set for life, that there's a different way we think about that now. So those are two ideas I think about a lot in this idea. Yeah. I, I'm going to go back a little bit, even if I understand your question right, to um, I do think we're going to have to start thinking about how do we teach the importance of post-secondary opportunities earlier. And I just, I feel like that's a, um, that's a challenge because if you're a, you know, middle school administrator, your, your hands are already full without thinking, oh, I'm also going to now be responsible for um, having these, these students start thinking about what comes five years from now or four years from now. But I, I do think we're going to need to do that. And I would, I would say this, the, you know, the old, you know, career day idea might be a little dated, but I think we need to think of new ways to have career day uh, in ways that are interesting um, to, to people and not think about it. Well, you know, dr dress up in for second grade is for whatever your parents do, but let's bring some people in at seventh or eighth grade that really do do those things that students are thinking, well, I, I might be interested in this so that they understand, okay, if I want to be, you know, fill in the blank, then here are the things that I need to be doing in the next four years to make that a realistic possibility. I, I think, again, the Back to we talked about technology, we, we now have access to, to, to people and things that we would never have been able to do before to bring into the classroom. So let's talk about how to do that. I mean, the, the reality is there are a whole lot of people that might agree to come up here before your class for 30 minutes over Zoom. Not quite as good as having them live, but you got a way better chance to get in them to come. Let's start thinking about that um, in new ways. Um, so we might pick interest um, earlier. Yeah, I bet um, some young smart Gen Zer could create us an app for that, right? There you go. <laughs> okay, so we just have a few minutes left. So these are all participant questions for the uh, last few minutes that we have. The next question, so I'm gonna concede you aren't mental health experts, so it's okay if you need to pass on this one, but somebody asks about um, the role of mental health in education, especially these days. Do you, have either of you heard of any innovations being implemented to either uh, look for early diagnosis or access to treatment? And again, completely okay if you want to pass on this one. I'm not certain I have much to add. In I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with the issue. I think the mental health challenges of this generation that, you know, are middle school to high school are huge. Um, I think the one thing that I, I've noted is that in we talked about before we have more of an issue with males dropping out, not going to community college. I think the mental health challenges uh, for females in, in this case might be even greater than males because as, a, as someone pointed out to me, males tend to bully each other physically. Uh, females are probably more uh, susceptible to bullying over social media. And as social media becomes the dominant form of interaction, I think you're seeing more of that, you know, you're not invited to this, whatever the issues are that, that, that increase those challenges. Uh, so I, I, I wish I had an ex a great idea, but all I'd say to the questioner is, I agree with you. I think the challenges are real and they're way bigger than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I would, I, would, I would not ignore the gender differences. Yeah, I don't, the only thing I would add in this is that like, humans build and thrive on connection and that that can be 
supplanted in some ways virtually, but it can't be replaced. Like you can, it, and that I, I think is a really critical thing for all of us to think carefully about is how do we create a sense of connection and belonging for kids that is in real, is in real life. Um, that's not always going to work for everyone, but it can work for a lot of kids. And I just, it's a lot, it's much, much harder to be dismissive or bullying or a jerk, quite frankly, in person. And it's a, it's an easy default when it's, when I don't have to sort of acknowledge that I'm saying and doing something to you in a, in real time or immediately. And I just, I, I, that, I, uh, that new one, it's, I worry about how we're we're not giving that to young people in the way that we experienced growing up, that ability to connect that way. Yep. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Um, okay, here's another one. I'm pretty sure this is for Governor Haslam. Why is it that Tennessee produces such extraordinary mm -hmm. leaders who go on to visible roles nationally and internationally? What's the secret? Uh, you know, it's just, it's in the water we drink. No, I, I wish I had a great answer. We have had, I mean, We've definitely outpunched our weight class, as they say there. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, we have historically produced a lot of those leaders when it was difficult to win, when the, the general election was a challenging election. Tennessee is, and I say this as a Republican, okay, so maybe I'm probably on thin ice with some people, but it's now become, we've become such a red state. If you win the primary as a Republican, you're probably gonna win the general election. I think a lot of our great leaders, I think about a Howard Baker, um, who you know was majority leader of the Senate, and Reagan's chief of staff, ambassador to Japan. He was the first Republican to win a, a Senate seat in like a hundred years when he won in the sixties, okay? You had to win a general election you had to not just get win your primary, but you had to win a very competitive um, race and get a lot of people uh, who typically voted on the other side. And I think an environment like that, believe me, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing for you know uh, for our state to become more democratic, but a, an environment like that forced you to be a different kind of leader who actually said, I, "I'm going to try to solve problems and I'm going to try to." Um, listen to the other side to get to a better place. And, uh, you know, I, I do think that's one of the reasons that historically we, we produced a lot of people who excelled on the national and international stage. There's a few Tennesseans who RSVP'd for this webinar, so I had a few guesses about who may have planned that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was a, that was a, a good objective answer. Thank you, Governor Haslam. <laughs> all right. So I took all my restraint not just to yeah. brag about Tennessee for five minutes. I could tell. I could tell you did great. Okay. All right. So we do have just about five minutes left. So I'm going to allow you all to to both of you to give some parting words of wisdom or advice to our participants here. So quick reminder on the webinar, we have educators, we have researchers, we have uh, nonprofit leaders, uh, some funders. Um, so that's your crowd that you're talking to today. What words of wisdom, um, given the data that Ann started us off with, the innovative things we've seen happen and where we need to go um, for our future workforce. Um, Ann, do you wanna start us off with some words of wisdom, parting words of wisdom? Well, sure, and I'm glad the governor will get the last word here. I, I would say that um, in a complicated landscape, try to, try to keep your eye on the most important things. Can kids read, write, and do math? And then are you building from there? And are, are we creating pathways to help them access, build their own agency and access opportunity? That's you can do that pretty specifically. If you think, if you really focus in on that, it can be, you kind of understand which shiny objects to pay attention to and which not. It takes a lot of discipline, I think, by from adults during when the political winds are blowing all over the place. But I think a laser focus on, on what kids, what kids are able to do, how do we know that and what is next for them is a is a is the only way you kind of make through a, a complicated time. I every time I'm sure like you both that I get the chance to talk with young people, I think, okay, I mean, right, it's not, it's not different. We don't have less smart kids, less passionate. I mean, these are kids that are brimming with potential and ideas and things we never come up with. And so um, 
this sort of raw energy is there for sure for some really incredible things going forward. And it gives me hope. That gives me hope. Uh, that's a great answer. And two, two things I'd say, um, number one, when people, when you leave office, people ask us, so what'd you learn as governor? What, what, what were your, what were your big takeaways? I said, well, I came into office thinking that, um, the most important thing we could do was provide great public education all the way through, you know, from K-12 through our post-secondary opportunities. And I thought, I, I really thought that was at the core of solving our other issues, whether it's economic development or health issues or, you know, our correction system, et cetera. I, I, I left thinking not only was it the most important thing, it was number one, two, three, four, five. OK, I, I really do think it's the foundation. So if you're out there and, and you're on this call and you're an educator thinking, I'm kind of discouraged, like I don't I want my life to count for something. I'm not certain it is. Let me assure you, you are doing the right thing. OK, it, it, it's, it's even more critical than I thought. That's number one. Number two, all of us, regardless of where you're on the political spectrum today, are frustrated and exhausted by the, the polarized nature of our discussion. Uh, I, I think everybody, not every, but almost everybody really is wanting to have different conversations. I, my hope is that education can be one of those places that facilitates those different conversations. You might say, well, we're the ones getting yelled at. We're not part of a discussion. Uh, and that's true. But I, I honestly think if, if you're on a school board, let's try to have a different conversation there. I know everybody wants a conversation always to be about mass versus no mask or what the bus schedule is going to be for next year and all those things. But we got to, I think we have a national crisis around, uh, around teachers right now. There's fewer and fewer people that want to teach. And that that's, I mean, understandably after the last two or three years, okay, let's talk about how we're going to recruit the next class, the next group of great teachers. Let's talk about, as Ann said, student outcomes and all this discussion. Let's have, let's say, I get it. It's really important. Um, these discussions that draw people to school board meetings. But what's even more important is, are our students uh, starting at point A and are they getting to point whatever, uh, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, whatever point we need them to get to. Uh, and at the core of all that is making certain we're recruiting great teachers and great school leaders. Um, let's make certain we're having those conversations um, while we're not ignoring people, people's concerns, but that, that my, one of my, like I said, my, two of my kind of fundamental concerns right now are if you tune into any school board meeting around the country, I think you'll be surprised how little conversations happens about student outcomes, number one, and number two, there's no conversation nationally about what are we going to do to recruit more people to be great teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, music to my ears, Governor Haslam. And maybe we can have those different conversations because we have common ground in this space and that's that we want more people to have more opportunities. So thank you both for the work that you do in this space. Thanks for joining us today. I've learned a ton. I hope our participants did. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. And Governor Haslam, I really hope you make your fly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Enjoyed being with you all.